Where we left off this morning is, actually we didn't read the last few verses of Exodus 14. For time, everybody knows what happened. But after verse 22, after Moses held out the rod of God and the waters parted, the children of Israel went through on dry ground. Verse 23 says, and the Egyptians pursued and went in after them into the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire. <clears throat> through fire? The Lord looked through fire? Let's remember that our God is a consuming fire. He was in that pillar and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians. What do you think that means that he troubled them? They were troubled. They were uncomfortable. What would you say, brother? Destroyed. Destroyed them. He's about to with the water. But even all that night before the water came upon them, it says here in this verse uh, that he troubled the host of the Egyptians. And here's a little bit of detail, specifics. Verse 25. And took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. Uh, yeah, your chariot gets pretty heavy when the wheels fall off, right? That's what happens. When I was a kid, we had a, a man and his wife who would come to our church, and they sang uh, Christian song parodies, parodies of popular songs. And I still remember one of those, you picked a fine time to leave me loose wheel, going to church and speeding downhill. And it went on. He, he had lots of good lyrics uh, for that. It actually taught, taught some good lessons, too. Verse 25, they drave them heavily with those chariot wheels falling off, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them. It was so obvious to them. The Lord is on their side. Why are we doing this? Why are we following Pharaoh? He claims to be God, and obviously he's not. They claim to be following the true and living God, and obviously he is. And by the way, we said that after the first plague, and the second plague, and the third plague, and he hardened his heart over and over again, and then the tenth plague. Now we've lost our kids. The Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians, 26, and the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, upon their horsemen. Notice the Lord asked Moses to do the same thing that he did to part the waters, hold out that rod in order to close the waters. And we know that there's nothing, no power in the rod. We know that there's no power in Moses. We know that all the power is of God. So what say you, why does Moses even need to hold out his hand? Why is this necessary? What is it? Faith. Faith. Yep, that's a good answer. Obedience, because he told him to, right? Yeah. Any other thoughts tonight? Why hold that out? You know, that rod is a picture of the Word of God. The man of God is supposed to hold forth the word of God that does have power in it. The rod didn't, but it pictured something that did. And at the word of God, these things happened. At the word of God, every drop of that water was created at the word of God. Every speck of sand that was under that water was created at the word of God. And it all obeys his words. We said... Fear not, Jesus said to the disciples in that boat, because he was in control of the wind and the waves, the storm and the sea. It all answers to him. <clears throat> and so in verse 26, the Lord has him do the same thing, stretch out his hand again. Uh, we presume holding that rod again as at the beginning. <clears throat> verse 27, and Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength. 
when the morning appeared. So the sea has strength, right? It's a strong force, and it returned to its strength. Why? Because it laid down like a whipped pup when God said to it to do that in Exodus. When Jesus said to do that in the Gospels, it uh, is under his strength. Then he returned it to his, to its own strength. And it says, uh, continuing in the second half of verse 27, when the morning appeared and the Egyptians fled against it, imagine seeing the wall of water coming at you. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. <clears throat> but the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore, some who washed up, right? And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians, and the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord, <coughs> excuse me, and his servant Moses, and it led them to praise. The very next verse, in the next chapter, 15 and verse 1, it's the first song on record. It was not on CD, it was on record. I've got all night. Okay, there's some laughter. First song on record. It's a song of salvation. Moses leads. All Israel echoes. By the way, Moses sings another song toward the end of his life. Uh, this time it's a solo, <clears throat> and he dies shortly after singing it. So let's look at these next verses at the praise and the song of Moses, and then we'll listen to your praise this evening and <clears throat> be thinking about what that would be. As a matter of fact, it's, very, it's a service just like this, usually when God decides, do they want me or not? Will I stay or do I go? Let's make sure he makes the right decision tonight. Chapter 15, verse number 1 says, Then sang Moses <clears throat> and the children of Israel this song, unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord. He was purposing in his heart, I will praise. For he hath triumphed gloriously, the horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him an habitation, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also were drowned in the Red Sea. Yeah, not the Red Sea, the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thine excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as an heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. He's still singing, by the way. They're still repeating. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Hey, there's a little clue right there as, as to maybe how God might have done it, right? People say, how did he part the Red Sea? Do you see the clue in that verse? What might God have used? wind, perhaps. I mean, that's what Moses observed, and he was there, and he saw him sink his lead a couple of verses before, like stones. Who is like unto thee, verse 11, O Lord, among the gods, who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, 
doing wonders. Are you hanging on these words? Aren't these amazing words of praise? You're a born-again believer. That's why you're looking down at your Bible and hanging on these words. Verse 12, Thou stretchest out thy right hand, the earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. The people shall hear and be afraid. Sorrow shall take hold on the inhabitants of Palestina. Then the dukes of Edom shall be amazed, the mighty men of Moab. He's thinking ahead of the enemies they will face. Trembling shall take hold upon them. All the inhabitants of Canaan shall melt away. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till thy people pass over, O Lord. That's into the promised land. Till the people pass over which thou hast purchased. Thou shalt bring them in and plant them in the mountain of thine inheritance. In the place, O Lord, which thou hast made for thee to dwell in. In the sanctuary, O Lord, which thy hands have established. He's already got a vision of the, the temple that will be built. 18, the Lord shall reign forever and ever. For the horse of Pharaoh went in with his chariots and with his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought again the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. The end of that song. We said this morning that they came out of Egypt high-handed. Exodus tells us that. A picture of the way they were rejoicing in what God had done in delivering them through these great plagues. They were saying, that's my God that does these mighty works and that defeated all the gods of Egypt and, and has led us forth from Pharaoh and I'm not going to wear these chains anymore and I'm going to be free. I'm not going to do all these tasks anymore. I'm not going to gather straw and mud and mix it up. And, and make brick, and I'm not going to carry these heavy loads anymore. They were walking out high-handed. And then their emotions went way down, right, with their back against the wall. And then God parts the Red Sea, and they're so excited that they sing this song along with Moses. And what's the irony? That in just a couple of verses, they're going to say, there's no water, we're all going to die here. Back down again all the way down and completely forgetting about what God has done. It's like, that was yesterday. What have you done for me lately, God? It's like Moses in the next few verses was saying, let's have a praise service. And they're saying, well, what's there to thank God for? Yeah. Um, ever since they sang this song of salvation, singing has been a way of rejoicing in God. And I believe it will be forevermore in heaven. And it can be a sentimental and slow and quiet song. And you know we like to tap our toes sometimes. Uh, I do believe that there is some kind of spiritual dance that will be done in heaven because the Bible talks about it. It's hard for me to imagine. God's going to have to teach me a little better how to do that. Salvation and song. Salvation and song are like Siamese twins that go together. Being saved makes you want to sing. It's one of, the, one of the marks of a believer that you see even in church is they're not just doing this. You know what I mean? They've got a song in their heart because it's real for them. Uh, this is a song of redemption, first of all. Go back to verse number 13, please. We're in chapter 15, verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast, what's the next word? Redeemed. And what were they redeemed by just in the previous chapter? We know what they were redeemed by at the Passover. They were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And so they might not have said, Redeemed how I love to proclaim it. But in their own words, in their own way, they were, they were singing, We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. This song of praise is a song of redemption. Redeemed by the blood. It's the only song of salvation. It's the song where you're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. It's the only way to be saved. It's by the blood of the Lamb. Let me put it another way. 
The song of redemption is only in one key. All who truly make it to heaven will have sung the same song in, in the same key. No variations, no alternate arrangements. There's no other way to get there than the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 1.5, I'll read it to you. It says, from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the first begotten of the dead, the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, listen to this, and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That is the song of redemption that will be sung in heaven. Revelation 1.5 tells us a song of redemption. Here in a moment, you'll have a chance to sing your song of redemption or give your praise. Tell us about your salvation. Secondly, this song was a song of victory. Victory. Because they looked back and they saw their enemies buried. And what do you think about when you think about something being buried and you're thinking about your salvation? What is it that was buried about you? Well, it was your sins. Our sins are buried. And where does the song say that our sins are buried? Where does the scripture say our sins are buried? In the deepest sea. What a picture of what happened right here at the Red Sea. Our wicked taskmaster buried. Buried. If one washed ashore, he was dead. And a reminder of all that they had been saved from. Would that dead soldier that they saw on the shore have some gold bands on his arms? Probably so. Would he have some gold around his neck? Probably so. Would they have taken that off of him? Before this day, probably so. And not now. They saw that their redemption was in Christ. It was all about what he did. And the riches of Egypt, none of those things had any appeal anymore. They're not going to long for those things for at least 24 hours. And then they're going to say, oh, the leeks, the garlic that we had. I don't know what these people's breath was like. But they longed for those things, the leeks and the garlic that they had back in Egypt when they got hungry in the wilderness. But not on this day, not on this day. We are given victory over sin, sin which pursued us like a bloodthirsty Egyptian, and our sins are buried in the deepest sea. And going with that victory is another victory. It's a victory over death. It's a victory over the grave. And if we'll claim it, victory over the world, victory over our own flesh and our addictions. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This song was a song of redemption. It was a song of victory. And of course, it's a song of praise, number three. A song of praise. This song was sung directly to the Lord. <coughs> The man who sang a special in church today told me after church, when I sing, I try to sing to the Lord, not to the people. It's a difficult temptation to want to sing to the crowd, right? Or to even feel good when the crowd claps like it's for you. Really, our applause ought to be to the Lord, right? We're showing appreciation, certainly, to someone, just like we're encouraging someone in the baptistry who follows the Lord in believer's baptism with, with our clapping. But really, we ought to be praising the Lord. This song was definitely sung unto the Lord, not as a public exhibition of skill. It probably didn't sound great coming out of Moses' lips. He said himself, I am s slow of speech and of a slow tongue. You know? And white man got no rhythm. This song was sung unto the Lord, not an exhibition of his skill or his talent. It was a pouring forth of thankfulness, and that's why they echoed him. God alone deserved the praise. God alone deserved the glory for this. And he got it, at least on this day. Tomorrow... It's a new chance, a new day, a new time to die to self and to give what the Bible calls 
the sacrifice of praise. Yeah, it's not just totally natural for us to be overflowing with gratitude. It's not in our human nature to just be all about the praise. It's a sacrifice, and to give it to the Lord, a sacrifice of praise. <clears throat> so what have we said here? It was a song of redemption, the blood of the Lamb, a song of victory purchased by Christ, a song of praise, the one it was for. Number four, a song of, <clears throat> excuse me, testimony. Testimony. What word do you see a lot of in verse number two? I'll give you a moment. What word besides like the or a or and, <clears throat> what important word <clears throat> or what word do you see several times in verse number two? Or form of the word. It may not look like a really important word, not much more important than an and or a the. Is. is. I, we're getting closer. What was it? My. Let's read it again with some emphasis here. The Lord is my strength. And song. By the way, who's our grammar people in the room? If you were diagramming that first phrase, it would say, The Lord is my strength and my song, right? The my applies to both strength and song, and so both would be attached to the word my on your on your brackets there. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my song. He has become my salvation. Why? He is my God. And I, that person was right too, will prepare him an habitation. My Father's God, I will exalt him. Uh, this is a song of personal testimony. When you give a personal testimony tonight, it's about what God's done to you. And it's okay in a testimony to talk about yourself and what God has done in you. What a personal thing is our relationship with God. Now we sing about my mother's Bible and nothing wrong with that. Or daddy's Jesus. Okay, tonight I'm preaching on Moses' song. Uh, but it's not just the God of our fathers. He's my God. <laughs> my God. And he's the one who did it for me. And so as I'm given a testimony, I'm saying here's my story about my salvation. I call it my salvation because after all, he's in my heart. I know he may be in yours. We're not talking about you right now. He's in my heart. It's a very personal thing. Here's my experience. It was a song of testimony. Number five, it was a song of dedication. Also in verse 2 is where he said, I will prepare him an habitation. A habitation. What's a habitation? It's like habitat, right? Habitat for humanity. What is that? It's where we live, right? Habitat. This is only natural. If God has taken us in, he's taken us in, the least that we can do is give him a home in us, a home in our hearts. It's a song of dedication here when he says, I will prepare him an habitation. And it's in the same verse where he was talking all about me, my, I. Very personal thing here. Dedicating himself to be the habitation of God. Listen to... Ephesians 2.22, it says, Ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 6.16, Ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them. I was on a visit this week to a church member who said, What can I do for the church? I'm looking for what can I do for the church. And I know what they meant. And we got around to what I know practically that they wanted me to say what job they could do in the church. But you know what my first answer to them was? 
be the church. First and foremost, just be the church. Be the temple of God. Be the bride of Christ that the church is. Make that your main thing. Because it's just not all about where you go to church or what you do at the church. Because a whole lot of those people live like the devil all week long. Be that habitation. Be the church. Ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's 2 Corinthians 6. Then John 14, 23. Jesus talking here and says, If a man love me, he will keep my words. My Father will love him. Listen to this. And we will come into him and make our abode with him. Christ in you, the hope of glory, Colossians 1.27. This is really what it's all about. It's not having church as much as being the church. And by the way, if you are truly being the church, as this person said to me, well, I want to come to church. <laughs> you're going to want to come to church when you're being the church. But it's not the end all to it. The Bible says that Jesus has gone to prepare a place for us. I've told you about getting my father-in-law in his nursing home to quote some verses, giving him some key words, and usually I'll give him two or three words, and then he'll give two or three words, and then I'll give a little bit more. But yesterday, what did I say? I said, Dad, um, in my father's, and he went, house or many mansions, if it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am there you may be also. He just continued, and we were all just blown away at the word of God hidden in his heart about this matter that he is about to enter the mansion prepared for him. He has gone to prepare a place for us, what place will we give him in the meanwhile? Will we invite him to the habitation of our heart? Home is where the heart is, right? Did you all hear in the news that Jimmy Carter's about to die? Habitat for your humanity has been one of the, one of the good things. You know, I want to be about praise tonight. What's something good I can say about Jimmy Carter? Habitat for humanity is something that comes to mind. It might be the only thing that comes to mind. But what a good thing there, because home is, means so much to someone, and a lot of people received homes in that way. Let's invite the Lord to take up the habitat of our heart, not just when we're saved, but I mean really having all of us and all week long, being the church. A song of dedication it was, I will prepare him in habitation, verse 2. Number 6, Moses' song was a united song. Surely there had been, for 400 years now, a whole lot of fighting, a whole lot of squabbling and bickering. There had been a lot of belly aching and complaining and griping. And it's amazing how that sort of thing all turns around in the face of great tragedy or great triumph. We change in the face of great tragedy or great triumph. And here they were coming off a great triumph, the horse and rider being cast into the sea. Tragedy and triumph have the power to unite us together about what's truly important. And it's in the Psalms where it tells us that they repeated after him and that they all sang together in unison. They sang in unison and it had to have been way sweeter than that old Coke commercial, you know, or anybody waving a candle or their phone in the air. Uh, saved by the same blood of the same Lamb, sanctified by the same Spirit, singing the same song. They were in unison. And in a way, I can feel some unity with those people who've been dead for many, many centuries, millennia at this point, because I am saved by the same blood of the same Lamb, and I am sanctified by that same Spirit. And in my own way, I can sing that same song. So can you. We said that it's a song of redemption 
and it's a song of victory, a song of praise and testimony and dedication. I just said it's a united song. And number seven, it's a song on the other side. Let me prove it to you that this is a song on the other side. For them, they had gone through the Red Sea, and now they were on the other side. But I mean another other side. Uh, Revelation 15.3, I will read it to you about those in heaven in the eternal state. It says this, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. This is in eternity future, singing the song that we just read in this text, the song of Moses, the song on the other side. It says, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Perhaps we'll look back on this life like a sea that God parted for us, making the way for us to the other side. Surely it will seem like a different side, like we're on a totally different shore when we arrive in heaven. Now we've said this a few times, and it bears repeating now. Right now in this world, we cannot bear the thought of loved ones of ours going to hell. We're all in agreement about that. Right now, we wouldn't wish hell on our worst enemies. But the Bible teaches that on the other side, God wipes away all tears from our eyes. And so in some majestic way that only our God can do, confronted with His holiness and His justice and this wonderful salvation and deliverance, somehow the destruction of the wicked, as awful as that will be, will not hinder the song of the saved. Perhaps it's through God wiping every tear from our eyes that, that makes that possible. The rushing together of the waves of judgment will somehow send up a hallelujah. On the other side, we too will sing louder and longer a new song with a fuller meaning and a fresher vibe than ever before. I believe it will ring out through the highest heaven and down through the ages with gathering power and sweetness. And though we spend all eternity trying, we never quite satisfy our heart's need to praise him who is worthy for all the praise. And that's the song of Moses. Let's pray. Lord, tonight... We don't want to wait for heaven to praise you. You are here in the midst, and we feel as though we are gathered around your throne as we gather around this rod of the word which Moses held high. I pray now, Lord, that you deliver us through the blood of the Lamb, through the word of our testimony. And our praises now, I ask in Jesus' name, amen.